series. We're only going to get to one today. But I, I believe that we ought to cover this one just for the sake of... Um, for the sake of that, for the fact that we've never really talked about this before, uh, and in the fifth century is when purgatory came into the teachings of the churches at the time, and it it became very popular. Um, Brother Beller calls it a make believe place where God holds captive those who need further penance for their sins. It's a way for Holy Mother Church to control people. And that's true, but I want you to pronounce it a different way for sake of memory. Call it purgatory. And if you do that, you'll understand the purpose of it, because that's what that word means. The purpose of purgatory was to purge them of their sins so they could enter into heaven. Uh, and it was a teaching that came in in that fifth century, and it, it, it became po more popular later on down the road. But that's what it means. Now, David Cloud has a lot of good uh, information on that. Also, Strong's and McClintock, which is that set up there, has some very good information. So I'm going to kind of read to you from both of those. And I think it's good that you and I understand uh, that what purgatory is and what they believe about it. Now, um, back in the... Well, I would say a few years ago, it was popular. Uh, uh, a pastor by the name of Joey Faust, uh, he made up what I call Baptist purgatory. And, uh, and he made up this teaching that basically, uh, because of the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and the children of the kingdom and, and the verses that are in Matthew from a parable, he decided to make that, that's where Baptists go that aren't obedient, that's where the that's where the Bible believers go that aren't obedient. They go to this purgatory and they kind of they kind of they sit in this holding cell for a thousand years or whatever until God lets them out uh, into the kingdom again and all this kind of or into the kingdom and uh, all that stuff. So Greg Dixon, before he died, uh, held to those beliefs of what I call that Baptist purgatory. He was preaching it at meetings. Those guys were. Him and uh, Joey Foss were preaching it at those meetings. Uh, and, you know, there's a reason why those guys held to that. And the reason those guys held to that, what I call Baptist purgatory, the reason they held to that was because they don't believe in repentance. I know that because I sat in Joey Foss' house years ago, and, uh, and I debated him for over an hour and a half in front of his family, I debated him on the doctrine of repentance. Now, that was not my idea. That was his idea. And I said, I really don't want to do this in front of your family. Uh, but he decided it, that it was okay. And I was like, I really wasn't that comfortable with it. But he, he challenged me on the doctrine of repentance. And I told him flat out. And I showed him what I believed from the scriptures. And we argued about it for a while. And, you know, we... we we talked it out, and I figured out that he believes in that Baptist purgatory because he doesn't believe in repentance. They don't believe in a gospel that changes people. They don't believe that. They believe, they believe in the, in the one, two, three, repeat after me doctrine, uh, and your life is all the same. And if you're not obedient, Christian, then you're going to go to this like Baptist purgatory, this like holding cell for a while, and you're going to kind of go there and... They, they went to the church fathers, I think he did, in The Rod Shall He Withhold It or something like that. I have that book in there. And it was something like that. I was like, whatever. And, and, and I, well, that's the way I took it because I was like, you have no Bible for that. Paul said very plainly, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. That's enough for me. I mean, if you're absent in the body, that means, hey, guess what? When you die, your soul lifts up, up it's gone. And you're with the Lord. I don't need anything else. Otherwise, Paul's contradicting what he's saying. And otherwise, and Jesus didn't tell the thief on the cross. He didn't say to him, uh, this day you'll be in purgatory. No, he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. That's pretty clear where he was going. And it wasn't a bad place. It was a good place. And it wasn't a holding cell. It was with him in glory. That's what he said, right? So we understand that that's true. And if, if you said, well, we could 
some purgatory up like that. Well, you could, but I think it's also a good idea to talk about it a little bit and to explain it, what they believe. Because, first of all, most Baptists never really know the doctrines of Roman Catholicism that they teach because we, we're not Catholic. But the thing is, is if you're going to get an understanding of what their doctrine is and their theology is, you got to kind of know what they believe so you can combat it. Because what they're saying to you is not, is not, is not, is not the same as what you believe those words to be. When you say repentance, they mean penance and working your way and earning it. That's what they, when you say repentance, you mean a change of mind that leads to a change of action, sorrow in the heart, and you're turning to Christ. What they believe is working on, is purging in purgatory, purging their sins in purgatory. And it's a control scheme, right, that was invented by men. And that control, control scheme that was invented by these men back in the 5th century, it didn't start out as that, it became that more. Okay, and it grew to this control scheme where Rome literally brought kingdoms down with that. They stole fortunes and they robbed uh, widows' houses and they, did, they stole lands from them. How do you think they're the richest land, landowners in the world? How do you think they have all the gold that they have and the money they have and everything else? This doctrine, this is one of those doctrines that made them a fortune. So I'm going to read to you some things that David Cloud wrote on that as far as purgatory goes, how he explained it. Then I'm going to read some things out of Strong's McClintock and some scriptural things to you for understanding. But believe me, this fifth century was the battle of the ages for this false doctrine that crept in because all of these doctrines crept in. And they were all taught to the people, and they began to be taught to the people, and they spread like cancer. And if they're not put down, then they grow into that antichrist beast. That's Look, fear is a tactic of Satan. He uses fear to control people, right? Where God leads you into the right way, he will tell you, listen, if you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell. What Satan does is he holds over, he holds over you fear. Never, never, he holds over fear to you and holds it and dangles it before you, right? And builds up anxiousness and control. That's how Satan works. So the word purgatory, it means to purge or to cleanse. So already what they're saying is the blood of Jesus Christ is not enough to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Their atonement is not a legal one in heaven that they believe that legally you have been atoned for. Your sins have been atoned for. They do not believe that. Why? Well, because I can't control you and steal your wallet if you, if you know your sins are forgiven. I mean, you realize that, right? Like... I can't make you give all the money you're supposed to give, and I can't control you, and I can't, I can't do that if, if I don't have purgatory hanging over you. I can't keep you obedient to Mother Church and keep you coming to the Mass and keep you coming to all these things if you're not, if you're not afraid, if it's not built on fear. So they're going to purge or cleanse. According to the Roman Catholic theology, purgatory is a place or a state where Christians go after death to suffer for sins not cleansed during their earthly existence. After an unspecified time of purgation, the soul is thought to go to heaven. It is said to be a place of suffering. Until recent years, purgatory was described as a place of fiery pain. But many Catholic priests today teach that the fires of purgatory, as taught in former days, might be symbolic. Oh, that's where Brother Billy Graham got it. He said the flames of hell were symbolic. Well, because his handler, Bishop Fulton Sheen, told him that's what it was. Right? They're just figurative flames. That's all. Masses are said for the dead in the belief that rituals and prayers can help speed the soul's escape from purgatory. Right? So in order to keep them saying their prayers and taking their vitamins like Hulk Hogan, in order to get them to keep doing that, what do they have to do? They threaten you that, well, your mom is in purgatory burning. 
So if you don't come and rub these magic beads and say your prayers, she's never getting out of purgatory. And if you don't slap me a $100 bill right now, you ain't getting, she ain't getting out of purgatory. If you ain't being faithful and giving all that money, then you ain't, you ain't getting her out of purgatory. It's that simple. Of course it's cruel. That's how the devil works. He is cruel. That's, that's, why people, that's why people look at Rome, the Antichrist beast, and they realize, wow, that is the kingdom of the beast. I mean, it is right there. Of course it is. The doctrine of purgatory, here's what Vatican II said. The doctrine of purgatory clearly demonstrates that even when the guilt of sin has been taken away, punishment for it or the consequence of it may remain to the expiated or cleansed. They often are. In fact, in purgatory, the souls of those who died in the charity of God and truly repentant, but who have not made satisfaction with adequate penance for their sins and omissions are cleansed after death with punishment designed to purge away their debt. That's Vatican II. Lovely. The church teaches us that, now remember, what is the church when we say that? That's holy, unholy mother church Rome, right? That's the woman. The church teaches us that after death, the soul still has to suffer purification. What? Yeah, the church teaches that, but the Bible doesn't. But see the difference? When you're Roman Catholic, see, this is what was creeping in. It was no longer the word of God. And we don't have time to read about vigilantius this week, but I'm teaching you all these doctrines because then I'm going to read you practically how a man that watched vigilantius that was watching these false doctrines and started hollering about them and preaching about them and writing about them and saying, this is wicked. He was living it. He was walking through it. He was serving the Lord at that time. He was pastoring and preaching and teaching and doing whatever. And, and he saw it firsthand. Yeah, he was vigilant. That's right. So see the difference in Rome, the difference in Roman Catholicism in this Baptist church that you're in right now. Well, I'll give you a perfect example, right? Here's the difference. We just, we just sat and talked about, you know, something that about, uh, women in evangelism, the proper role, this and that, right? We had that discussion. Well, we let the Bible settle that, right? Well, we don't see that in the Bible as something that is, you know, uh, admonished or told uh, for us to do or whatever, or systematic. We don't, we don't see that as commanded by the scriptures or anything like that, right? Um, and all that kind of stuff. And we don't, we hold to that keepers. I don't, we hold those things. So w what determined that? Was it me standing up here as the bishop and, and the representation of the church? Or was it the scriptures? It was the scriptures, right? It wasn't the, it wasn't the church that's the final authority. Do you see the difference? That's the difference. In Rome, with Roman Catholicism, the church is the final decider of what happens. But here, the Bible is the final decider of what happens. Do you see the difference? This is why you can have a bishop. This is why you can have a pastor, and it's not wrong to have a local New Testament church and have a pastor with authority and all those. Why isn't it wrong? Well, because his authority is derived from the scriptures, and he has to submit to those same scriptures. Do you, you see the safety in that? But Rome doesn't. Rome doesn't submit to the scriptures. Rome and their bishops are the church. You see what I mean? That's the difference. Major difference. The church teaches us that after the death, the soul still has to suffer purification. That is the meaning of the word purgatory before it is able to see God. It will certainly be a painful purification. That is why it is represented by the image of a fire. The doctrine of purgatory reflected in the scripture and developed in tradition. Reflected in the scripture and developed in tradition. If your doctrine is developed by tradition, then it's not Bible doctrine. Correct. It's teaching the for the commandments of men, right? Mm -hmm. It's not teaching God's commandments. It's Pharisees that have set up and they teach for uh, the, the obedience to the commandments of what? Men. To the exclusion of commandments to what? The Bible. Obedience to the commands of the Bible. It is different. It is not the same. 
they've developed their doctrine with tradition, well then it has no eternal weight. It has no power. It is not real. It was clearly expressed in the Second Council of Lyons in 1274. Besides declaring the fact of purgatory, the Second Council of Lyons also affirmed that the faithful on earth can be of great help to persons undergoing purgatory by offering for them the sacrifice of the Mass, prayers, almsgiving, and other religious deeds. Sow your seed. Right? They are the original Creflo dollars. They are the original Slimy Joes. They are the original Sloppy Joe, right? They're the original Joel Osteen. They are. They're the original hucksters. They're the original pimps. That's who they are. That's who those people are. That's who those priests are. Because they're telling you flat out, well, if you just pay enough money and you do enough alms and you say enough masses, then you can get them out of purgatory. That's a horrible thing. How do you know they got out of purgatory? Like what, what says, do you get like a vision? Does a, does, do you get a message from purgatory saying, saying hey, you've been upgraded? You get a certificate? Uh, get out, did, does, is it like Monopoly? If you pass go, do you collect $200? Get out of purgatory. Do you get out of pur purgatory free card? How does that work exactly? What is, the, what is the number of masses? What is the number of those things that I can be assured that they're getting out of purgatory? What is that number? I don't know, but um, didn't indulgences um, come about in the middle of the Dark Ages? Did what now? Selling of indulgences. Yes, the same time as this. It was coming. Not quite yet, but it was coming. Yep. Probably. I don't know the exact year of those. I'd have to look. But around that time is when everything starts. When you start having purgatory, when you start having those doctrines, you're going to make the way for those indulgences to be, to be, uh, to be sold. Right. Right. Okay. So he says, by, besides declaring the fact of purgatory, what are your facts based on truth or what you feel? It, um, okay. So I'm going to read you, I'm going to get to the scriptural point of that in just a second here, but I want to give you a little bit of history, um, just a little bit of history on that so you understand kind of how that came about a little bit. Because you're like, how do Bible believers, how did they go from, how do these people that believed in the scriptures, how did they go from believing in heaven and hell, believing in all, to all of a sudden believing in something that doesn't even exist in the scriptures at all. Purgatory, uh, from the word purjo, meaning I cleanse, is the name given in ecclesiastical language to the place of durance, which the Church of Rome and the Eastern Church teach holds the departed souls until fitted for the divine presence. So, in other words, basically what they're telling you, Christ does not fit you for the divine presence, but all my prayers almsgiving, masses, and all of those things will fit you to be in the presence of God. Friend, you're in a lot of trouble if Christ's blood does not fit you for heaven. There is no other fit for heaven. There is no other redemption. Amen. If Christ doesn't do it, then we are of all men most sorrowful because there is no hope because uh, prayers from a bunch of uh, uh, of sinners is not going to take you to heaven. And the lighting of candles and the giving of money and anything else is not going to. According to the teachings of these churches, the Protestant is wrong in declaring that Christ brings a full and perfect pardon for all sins of man. Before the man can be received into heaven, his soul must be purged by fire from all carnal impurities. Christ only affords a way whereby eternal punishment may be escaped and, and through and though contrition secures forgiveness of sins, the ordinary experiences of penance, attrition, must be supplemented by penance. In other words, it is necessary according to Romish theology to complete salvation and purification that the soul should suffer a part of the penalty of its sins. And if these are not voluntarily born in penance in this life, they will be inflicted in purgatory in the life to come. Except when special suffering inflicted by divine providence serves the same purifying purpose. 
The doctrine of purgatory does not therefore involve the idea of future redemption of the impenitent. The souls who go to purgatory are only such as die in the state of grace united to Jesus Christ. It is their imperfect works for which they are condemned to that place of suffering and which must all be there consumed and their stains purged away from them before they can go to heaven. The Council of Trent decided thus, if anyone say that after the grace of justification received the fault is so pardoned to every penitent sinner and the guilt of temporal punishment is so blotted out that there remains no guilt of temporal punishment to be done away in this world or that which is to come in purgatory before the passage can be opened into heaven, let him be accursed. Yes. Elsewhere it is said there is a purgatory and the souls detained there are helped by the suffrages of the faithful but principally by the sacrifices of the acceptable altar. In other words, show me the money. Put them dockets in my pockets. That's what they're saying. They are gaming you. They are fleecing you. They are taking you. Just like I talked to that, to that archbishop up there that was sent over there to cover up all the sex scandals over there and appointed by, by the Pope. Was it Benedict or was it? Uh, Francis, Francis, uh, uh, by, by Francis, <laughs> and he, he was just like I had that conversation with him, you know, and, and talked to him about that, and you could see, I'm like, so you got liquor paying for all this stuff here, you guys are getting all drunk, and you're having liquor paid for this building, well, you don't know if anybody's getting drunk in there, <laughs> well, it's like, you really think I'm that stupid, like, you really think we're that dumb, we're watching it, that, you know where, I know that he learned that logic from Augustine, because he had to, because that's how stupid Augustine's logic sounds. Exactly that dumb. You don't know if they're getting drunk in there. No. And apparently we don't know that people that preach celibacy don't rape children either. Apparently we don't know that's going on either. Right. The Council of Trent decided thus. Oh, I read that. Sorry, that's the Council of Trent. That's an important one, I think. A statement obviously vague and indefinite. It leaves the most important inquiry undetermined. Whether the souls in purgatory are in a state of happiness or misery. They are detained, but nothing more as defied is stated. By referring, however, to the Catechism of the Council of Trent, drawn up by the order of the fathers, they're assembled, we get a clear and more explicit definition. They said this. There is a purgatorial fire where the souls of the righteous are purified by a temporary punishment. This is what, by the way, this is almost the same thing that Joey Foss taught too. That entrance may be given them into their eternal home where nothing that is defiled can have a place. And the truth of this doctrine, which holy councils declared to be confirmed by the testimony of scripture and of the apostolic tradition, the pastor will have to declare more diligently and frequently because we are fallen on times in which men will not endure sound doctrine. Now, again, I'm not implying that Joy Foss is teaching the same Catholic doctrine because he's not the same way they teach it, but the premise is pretty much the same. It just is. Um, anyway. Because we are fallen on... So basically, he's saying it's sound doctrine to say that people are burning in purgatory until their sins are paid for. Thus, a definite meaning is given to the vague teaching of the council. There is a purgatorial fire, and the souls of the faithful are punished for a defined period till their sins are expiated. The almost universal belief prevailing among Roman Catholics, though, they do not consider torment by fire as being uh, defied, but only the most probable opinion is that purgatory is a place of suffering or punishment for imperfect Christians. Well, that would be everybody, because there is no perfect Christian. So, I don't know how that works exactly. Well, because those people were in Christ, so they were saved. But when they're saved, they're put in a holding cell until they're perfect. They're sort of saved. Yeah. Well, they're in Christ yeah. because they were in the church. But the fire doesn't work on that. Without... No, the fire is deified, what he's saying there. It's, okay. That's different for the lost people. It's a holding cell. 
Outer Darkness, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. It's a temporary punishment. Bellarmine says, Purgatory is a certain place in which, as in a prison, the souls are purged after this life, which were not fully purged in this life. How does one get fully purged in this life? Yes, I'm going to get to that. Yep, yep, they did. They absolutely did. Okay, let's see here. Uh, let's see, which we're not fully purchased. Life. To wit, so that they may be able to enter into heaven where no unclean thing can enter, and elsewhere that the fathers unanimously teach that the pains of purgatory are most severe or terrible. So the fathers taught this. Do you notice, what didn't they say taught this? The scriptures, yeah. They didn't say the scriptures taught this, did they? They said the fathers taught this. So their arguments for purgatory are this. Every sin, how slight soever, though no more than an idle word, as it is an offense to God, deserves punishment from him and will be punished by him hereafter if not canceled by repentance here. Your sins are not canceled by repentance. Your sins are canceled by Christ. Right. He is the one that, that sacrifices. Uh, you know, there's a preacher that preached a sermon that Brother Marv gave me the clip of it. And, and I wouldn't agree with this preacher on a lot of things. But he preached this sermon, and he said, if, you, if you're ever asked why, why uh, you'll go to heaven or why you're forgiven, if that starts out with I, like I repented and believed the gospel, he said, that's not the right way it should start out. It should start out, he said, with Jesus in the third person, he said. With, and his point was is that after we get saved and the longer we serve the Lord, sometimes you know, we, we start to look at those things more than we do Christ. And then and we forget that, no, it's Jesus that paid it all. It's, the, it's like the thief on the cross. He, he gave this illustration and he said this story. Did you see that video? It was a good one, wasn't it? He gave that illustration and he goes, the thief on the cross, he said he was, he was joking, but he said, you know, he got to heaven and he stands up in the gates and he's walking, he's getting ready to walk in. And they said, well, do you know what, what it means? To, you know what justification by faith means? And do you know what this doctrine means? And do you know what that doctrine means? And he was like standing there and no. And he goes, well, then why, why are you coming in here? And he goes, all he did was point because he said I could. And he said, he said his reasoning was, well, because he said I could, because all the thief on the cross knew was, well, he said I could, right? Amen. That's how simple salvation is. That's true. Why? Because Jesus said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. He's saying, because he said I could, that's why. And guess what? That's enough. Amen. That's still enough. It'll always be enough because he said I could, right? Because he already paid it all. He already did it all, and that's where our focus ought to be. Here, what is their focus on? An ultra focus on sanctification, but also the church's authority through that. And their focus becomes what? Church authority, humanism. Their, their, their focus becomes on what you and I do in this life, works. So if I want you to, look, I, we don't preach. I think it's absolutely amazing that you can go to many churches, a Roman Catholic churches, or even other churches that teach false doctrine of work salvation things like that and they have probably have a hard time getting people to do stuff but we believe it's the grace of god that leads men to serve the lord we believe because we are saved we want to serve the lord because we love him because we've been forgiven much right so we want to see other people saved it's not forced it's not out of fear i hope none of you are serving the lord out of fear uh, uh, or, or out of a desire to earn your way or work your way to anything because that's the wrong purpose and it will never work, right? It's because we've been saved that we serve him. It's because he gave us grace. It's because we're forgiven. Where there's power to forgive sins, there's fear. There's a godly reverence and fear because he has power to forgive sins, right? And it's a reverence. Therefore, they say, few will escape. He said this. They say this uh, for their arguments of purgatory. Few depart this life so pure as to be totally exempt from spots of this nature and from every kind of debt due to God's justice. There is no one that is spotless in the sense of their sanctification. 
Our justification is by faith in Jesus Christ. Our justification is a legal transaction that took place in heaven. It took place on the cross of Calvary and that blood of Christ was taken to heaven and the sinless, perfect son of God stood there before God, stood there as the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. It's our justification. It's not our sanctification. It is not. The works that you do and the reason we live a holy, sinless, and separated life unto God is because he justified us. It's because he forgave us our debt that we owed. Right. You can't purge out. You will never live perfectly sanctified in this life. Why? Because you have flesh and you have a fallen nature still with you. And you will always battle that nature until you're home. Or you should be battling that. If you're not, you have other problems you need to deal with. From these positions, right? Therefore, few will escape without suffering something from his justice for such de debts as they have carried with them out of this world. According to the rule of divine justice by which he treats every soul hereafter according to his works and according to the state in which he finds it in death. That's nowhere to be found in the scriptures. Nowhere. From these positions which the advocates of the doctrine of purgatory consider as so many self-evident truths, they infer that there must be some third place of punishment. Okay, so check that out. They invented a third place because of their reasoning. They reasoned that since men still sin and they're Christians... They reasoned in their mind that because of that, there must be a place after death that you go to be purged of your sins. But the Bible says the blood of Christ purges us, right? Cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. It's Christ's blood. It's not Christ's blood plus our sanctification. It's Christ's blood, period. It's the atonement that was made for us. It isn't anything we can do. They confuse justification and sanctification. They confuse it. They mix it together. Your sanctification is not a basis for your justification. I would argue the opposite. Your justification is reasoning for your sanctification and ability to be sanctified. Because truth be known, your justification and your sanctification both come from the workings of the Holy Ghost of God. They do not come from works of righteousness, which we have done. They come from the movement and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in you. That's where they come from. They do not come from anywhere else. So they reason this out. Let's see here. I won't read you all of it because it'll make your head spin. But have something in justice to suffer. There must of necessity be some place or state where souls departing this life pardoned as to the eternal guilt of sin, yet obnoxious to some temporal penalty, or with the guilt of some mortal sins and some venial faults are purged and purified before their admittance into heaven. Where does it say the difference between mortal sins and venial faults? Yeah. Those in purgatory relieved by the prayers of their fellow members here on earth, also by alms and masses offered up to God, for their souls, such as have no relations or friends to pray for them or give alms to procure masses for their relief, are remembered by the church, which makes a general commemoration of all the faithful departed in every mass and in every one of the canonical hours of the divine office. You do realize that there are millions of people that are stuck in this. There are millions of people tonight that go to mass and they go and they give money and they give everything and they give that stuff so their family members can get out of purgatory. Do you realize that? Yeah, billion Catholics worldwide. Think about how many, how many of those pray for those people that are already dead. And they, they're trying to pray them into heaven. They're trying to give money for them into heaven. They're trying to get them into heaven. It's It's evil. Okay, besides the above arguments, the following, they use passages from Maccabees. They use Matthew 5, 25, that prison, right? Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. 
Well, that was like an that was like a uh, parable. That was a parable. That was not that was not a that was not a defined teaching on the afterlife. Duh. Sure. What's that? Yes, he does. And he gives it in the, in the Gospels over and over again, right? But they reject that for their allegorical understandings of things, and they grab onto things, and that's what they do. That's how they teach it. What's that? Yes, same as infant baptism. And there's as much Bible for infant baptism as there is for purgatory. None. Same amount. So they say the language of the Psalms. They try to pull it out of there. They try to pull it out of Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So they take that and in, in true Augustinian and origin fashion. They take that and allegorize that and turn that into the afterlife and make a big load of money on it. Because don't the, it is about the money. That's what it's about. That's what purgatory is about. And some of you, you know, you, you don't know anything about Roman Catholicism or you've never been around it, so it doesn't bother you. Other people, it bothers me a lot. When I think about how much, how, what, they've, what they've done to people, they've not only enslaved them in this life, but they've made them twofold the child of hell somewhere else. And they, they, they've ruined their lives. And then they threaten and control them, right? That's what they do. They threaten and control them. And then this battery's going dead. They, maybe I've been preaching too long, right? The, uh, they, they've been threatening and controlling them for years, stealing everything they have. Yes. Those in indulgences, right, those in indulgences are used as to control, right? Right? If one, if one king commits adultery or fornication and they find out about it, what do they use? They use it as control, right? So they're literally begging at the Pope's feet for forgiveness. Right, so go kill the Waldenses or somebody else, right? Uh, they cite Ambrose, they cite Hillary, they cite Cyprian, not Hillary Clinton, um, Tertullian, all, yeah, anyway. Um, she would be considered a witch, yes, but not, not a popish witch, but a black witch more than a white witch, I would say. But, but a most of all, Augustine, from whom many passages are cited, in whom the doctrine is found in all the fullness and its modern detail, the epithas of the catacombs, too, occasionally supply Roman controversy. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. There's, and then there's the, uh, uh, yeah, who cares? Um, about that, that doesn't really matter to us any. Uh, the medieval doctrine and practice regarding purgatory were among the leading grounds of the protests of the Waldenses and other sects of that age. That's why the Waldenses called them Antichrist. They said the Pope, yeah, he's the Antichrist, that guy right there, that guy. <laughs> and for all purposes in that time, he was. Right? In the time they lived, he was. And that system was the beast system. And they, they just said... That's who he is. That's, that's Antichrist right there. That's secession of popes, right? That was believed. That's who he is, and that's what they are. They are Antichrist. So they had a problem with purgatory. They had a problem with the indulgence. They had a problem with all those things. You know, and they stood up against them, and that's why they were hated so much. In the modern Romish church, the doctrine of purgatory has led to others more directly injurious and corrupting. By the terror which it inspires, it gives the priesthood power to impose penit penance, Penances, it leads to indulgences and prayers for the dead, for it is held that the sufferings in purgatory may be greatly mitigated and shortened by the prayers, services, masses, and charities, and other works of supererogation of their friends upon the earth. The extent to which this doctrine has been employed in increasing the income of the church receives a significant illustration in one singular fact. There exists, at this time when this was written, by the way, it was back in the late 1800s, there exists a purgatorial insurance company which for a certain premium paid annually insures the payer a given number of masses for his soul in the event of his death and the certificate of this insurance company may be seen hung up on the walls in hundreds of rooms in the tenement houses of our great cities, especially of New York. You didn't get one of those certificates, did you? Okay. If you get one, can you get me one? If you, if you find one, I would like one of those. If anybody has one of those certificates, I'd like one of those. 
I want to, yeah. no, no, I just want one so I can, I can show everybody. I wonder if I can find one. That is. Scott, we need to find that one on eBay, see if somebody's got one of those old policies. Just a picture of that. I'd like to have that. Okay. So we take the, obviously our number one, and we're going to get to the, the argument here uh, real quick here. We'll get to, which is not that hard because it's really simple. I could go on and on and on. Again, with Strong's McClintock, they give you 100 pages of things, and we don't need that many, uh, especially about purgatory. So, but we will finish up with some scriptural things here. Um, let's see here. There we go. Okay. So, wow, that's weird. I've never done that before. Did you know you can turn the text sideways like that? That is weird. You knew that? What's that? Yeah. On pages. I didn't know I could do that. That's weird. Anyway. The true Christian, number one, the true Christian goes directly to the presence of Christ at death. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I believe it's 5, 8. Yep. Paul says it this way, very clearly under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. We are confident. Let's stop there for a second. We are confident. So... I mean, God knew what was coming, the false doctrine and everything. God knew what that was. So Paul makes it very clear. He says, we are confident. I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There's only two places in that sense. Three, if you, heaven, hell, and the body that you're in right now on earth, right? But heaven or hell when you die, that's it. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, is Paul talking about acceptance as in working his way to heaven? No, he's saying that our service would be acceptable because we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ for our rewards. We're already in. You understand that? We're not trying to get on the team. We're not auditioning for the Olympics. We're already in. We're already on the team. We've already been given our uniform. We've been given our armor. We've been given the, the earnest, the down payment of the Holy Ghost. We've been given that sealed under the day of redemption. You are in. And Paul says, look, we're confident in this thing. That that's the way it works. Right? Philippians chapter 1. Paul says this, for I am in a strait betwixt two. Two. He says, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Now, there, you know, he, he talks about confidence again. And he says his confidence is there that that's the way it works. That's the straight betwixt. Either I'm here or I'm with Jesus. I ain't going to be anywhere else. There is nowhere else to be. You're either here as a saved person or you're with Christ. There isn't another place. Amen? You believe that, don't you? Okay, some of you are quiet, half sleeping tired, you ate too many cookies, some of you ate too many pieces of cake, I don't know. I didn't have any sugar, so I'm doing all right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. 
Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So we comfort each other with this. This is a consistent testimony of the apostles. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The apostle Paul looked forward to death, to depart, and to be with Christ. In discussing the resurrection translation, the apostle Paul says the Lord Jesus will bring the dead saints with him from heaven when he comes. Right? They're going to come with him. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. There you go. Pretty clear, isn't it? There is no hint of some coming from any other place, such as from purgatory. Death cannot and does not separate the believer from Christ. Nothing can. His blood has forever removed the sin barrier. When Christ died, he cried, it is finished. At that moment, the veil of the temple was rent. God, thereby signifying the entrance into the very presence, had been accomplished. The believer can praise God for his blessed certainty. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 19. Sin does indeed demand suffering, but the Bible gives us the good news that Jesus Christ, God's son, has already suffered for sin in our place. Isaiah chapter 53 says he already suffered for us. Yes, we don't slight sin at all uh, in that sense. We, th we make a big deal about sin because Christ paid for it. So we hate sin and we want to stay away from sin because Christ died for our sins. And we don't want to shake hands with the enemy of God. We don't want to nurture in our bosom sin that put Christ on the cross. God forbid, right, that we should do that. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Once? The just for the unjust. Who's the just? Christ. Who's the unjust? Us. Who suffered for us? Christ that he might bring us to God. How? Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That's how, very plainly. That's the gospel in one verse right there for you, right? Amen. It, it does get gooder too, by the way. Amen. <laughs> for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's why we're supposed to live for God, because of everything Christ did for us. Right? Not, not because we're in fear that if we don't do enough, or you don't need to live in fear that your family's in purgatory and that you've got to pray them out somehow. Well, listen, I'll be honest with you. I don't know anybody that's, good at that, that, that's that good at praying anyway. <laughs> right? I, I'm not sure about that. I don't know anybody that can be that good at praying, right? There was one prayer answered that you and I would never go, and that's John 17, right? That we would be saved out of the world, right? That we would be saved, right? That was John. That was the high priestly prayer. There's only one prayer that prays you out of, prays you from going to hellfire. That is, and that's Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17. His. By the way, did you know that all of your prayers are answered because John 17 was answered? Yep. Do, you, do you know that? That all of your prayers that God answers for you is because of Christ. You believe that, don't you? Yeah, you don't yeah. believe. Yeah, you don't believe that your prayers are answered because of you, right? You know that your prayers are answered because of Christ. That's why we can pray boldly because of what Jesus did. These are good doctrinal lessons, aren't they? Well, I hope you can stay awake long enough for them. And they, really, they really will help you. They'll help you with your peace, too. Because it puts your focus on Jesus and not on you. Not looking at your worthless flesh trying to find some virtue somewhere. I'll help you. You won't find it. Just look to Jesus. Look at him. Keep your eyes on him. That's where the virtue is.
That's where the moral power is. That's where the moral purity, that's where the holy energy is, right? I talked to Paul and I talked about that. He said he was looking at virtue, that word. I told him I did a broadcast a few weeks ago on virtue. It touched and he felt, he felt that holiness, that holy energy leave him. He felt, Christ felt it. When that harlot touched him, or that woman uh, with the issue of blood touched him. The Roman Catholic Church has turned the Lord's Supper into a grand religious pageantry, which they call a sacrifice, but it knows nothing about the real efficacy of the sacrifice which the supper pictures. The sacrifice has entirely and eternally removed the sin barrier between God and the individual who exercises personal repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' blood cleanses the believer from all sin and gives him perfect righteousness before God. No true believer will ever suffer fiery torment for his own sins. My goodness, you couldn't pay for them ever. Eternity of you burning could never give any virtue. Virtue comes from God alone. In Christ Jesus, the Lord, Christ is the only way, his virtue. There is no virtue in you and I besides what the Holy Ghost has imparted to us. It's all of Jesus, none of us. I like that. You know why? Because I can't do anything right. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> the good that I would do, I do not. Amen. Right? Yeah, no, because no, he already paid for it. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Some of you got some problems today, and your problems are you're not your eyes aren't on Jesus. You're looking at yourself, and you're getting discouraged. Well, why wouldn't you be right. looking at that mess? Amen. What do you want to look at that mess for? Looking at yourself. What a mess that is. You may not like that, but I, when I look in the mirror, I see the same mess. Right? When I keep my eyes on that mess and not on Christ... What a mess that is. Boy, you want to get yourself messed up and feel bad. You just look at yourself for a while. There's never been any virtue in you. He didn't save you because you were virtuous. He saved you because of his mercy and his love. And you ought to give glory to his name and keep your eyes on him and off yourself. Man, I feel like yelling. Amen. Into one of these three hour preach a thons here. I gotta. <laughs> but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Christ, of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Man, I like teaching on this purgatory because I get to teach the gospel what it really is. Amen? It's pretty good. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's pretty clear, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we talked about. How about Ephesians chapter 1? I'm making you get in your Bible so you'll wake up. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? How about verse 7? In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, According to the riches of your good works. No. According to the riches of how good you feel today. No, that's not in there. Right? That's not in there. According to the riches of his grace. Amen. All of grace is my story. Amen. All the way from earth to glory. Amen. What a gospel. What a Savior. Hebrews 9, 12. I would say we're almost done, but I'd be lying. So, 
<laughs> I, I, I gotta stop. Uh, Sometimes this is fun though. I'm enjoying this. Amen. Good Bible study now and then. Good for you. Then Hebrews nine. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, right. having obtained eternal redemption for us. Once and for all. Once. That's it, isn't it? How about 1 Peter? We might have done this one, but we'll check it anyway. 1 Peter 2, maybe not. That's some solid doctrine right there, isn't it? Who his own, verse number 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Where did he bear the sins? In his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Ye were healed. This is the atonement. This is Isaiah 53. That's it. Amen. Amen. That I told you it got gooder, didn't I? It did. It done got gooder on you, didn't it? Huh? Amen. It got gooder. Joy's going to be putting these down in, in writing, and she's going to have to put down gooder, and the, the, the thing's going to be like, there's no such thing as gooder. Yes, there is. This is gooder. Right? So then in like, when I die in like 30, 40 years, they're going to be reading this like, what was wrong with this guy anyway? And some of these kids are going to be like, you just had to know him. <laughs> you, just, you just had to know him. <laughs> you, just, you just had to know him. He's kind of weird. but <laughs> we, just put up, we just put up with him. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. We've did this one. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Amen. The Roman Catholic Church has no scriptural authority for the teaching of purgatory. A key authority cited by the Catholic Church for purgatory is a quote from one of the apocryphal books, which nobody cares about because it's not the Bible anyway. At least we don't because we're Baptists and we don't believe in make-believe books. The Roman Catholic Church has no authority for offering masses for the dead. The mass supposedly is the Lord's Supper. Where does the Bible indicate the Lord's Supper is for the dead? Where does the Bible teach the believer to pray to or for the dead? Next, money cannot purchase forgiveness or spiritual blessings of any sort. According to Roman, a Roman Catholic practice, listen to this, the wealthy can get out of purgatory more quickly than the poor because the rich can afford more masses. Joseph Zacolo, Zacolo, former Roman Catholic priest, said that the priests in the U.S. make over $22 million as personal income by celebrating masses for dead Roman Catholics. That's from the Challenger, January 1984. Though this little bit of through this little bit of information, we see behind the mystery of why Roman Romanism perpetuates the concept of purgatory, even while there's no hint of scriptural backing. The RCC through the centuries has enriched itself through its lies about purgatory and the mass. This reminds us of Peter's description of some false teachers, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. There it is. There's their Pope giving them a prophecy about themselves. Right? wonder how often they read that one. Probably not too much. The Bible says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the malt of the riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Ooh. Psalm 49, 6 through 7. Thy money perish with thee. Yeah, remember Simon? Simon Magus? Simon the Sorcerer. I like what, and we're done here. I like what J.A. Wiley said here. J.A. Wiley was the writer of a number of things, but the history of Protestantism, which is very good, by the way. It's got a good history of the Waldenses and other things, which I started doing on my broadcast one time, and then I stopped because, well, I don't know, it's just me. I do weird stuff like that. But anyway, um, He's a very good historian, by the way. He has a lot of good records, and this is what he says. The Scripture authorizes no such distinction as papists make between venial and mortal sins. It teaches that all sin is mortal, and unless blotted out by the blood of Christ, will issue in the sinner's eternal ruin. It teaches that after death there is neither change of character nor of state, that God does not sell His grace, but bestows it freely. 
that we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, that no man can redeem his brother, whether by prayers or by offerings, that the law of God demands of every man, every moment of his being, the highest obedience of which his nature and his faculties are capable, and that since the foundation of the world, a single work of supererogation has never been performed by any of the sons of men, and that therefore the source whence the imaginary fund of merit is supplied has no existence, and is like the fund itself, a delusion and a fable. And it teaches, in fine, that God pardons men only on the footing of the satisfaction of his Son, which is complete and sufficient and needs not to be supplemented by works of human merit, and that when he pardons, he pardons all sin and forever. Amen. But the grand criterion by which Rome tests all her doctrines is not their truth, nor their bearing on man's benefit and God's glory, but their value in money. How much will they bring is the first question which she puts. And it must be confessed that in purgatory, she has found a rare device for replenishing her coffers of which she has not failed to make the very most. Popery, says the author of Kerwin's letters, meets men at the cradle and dogs them to the grave and beyond it with its demands for money. J.A. Wiley's The Papacy, 1888. Amen. Good quote. And I agree with that. They dog, they get a hold of a baby, they get them from the cradle to the grave, don't they? And beyond the grave. That's a money scheme right there. And that's what purgatory is. Not a bit of truth in, the, not a bit of truth in it. The blood of Jesus is all sufficient. If it's not, then no amount of money or anything anybody pays for you. By the way, why would you want to pray to a God who said he gave you eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord and then, he sa and then his sacrifice is not sufficient enough to pay for it? Why wouldn't you just go party it up, live it up, and live for the world? Why would you even bother with paying a bunch of priests and doing all this stuff when the blood of Christ couldn't forgive your sins? If it didn't have power to do that, if some other entity had to come in or, or my works had to match with it in order to make it work. Why, who would want to serve a God like that? Why do you think there's so many disillusioned Catholics today? Because yeah. they start reading just a nominal amount of other things and then they're like, whoa. Or they see in their actual Bible, they start to look at it and say, well, that's not in there. It's a control scheme. Much of Rome is a control scheme. And you're going to see more of those next week. Well, maybe not next week, but in a few weeks. Second Corinthians 5, 1, you and things like Go ahead, brother. <laughs> For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. Amen. We know. we know. That's right. And the other thing, Joshua, they do use, and I didn't read that, but in, in Strong's McClintock, he talks about that. And I just didn't want to belabor it any longer. But in Strong's McClintock, and I'll show you that. You can do it online if you want to look at it. They, they take some of those texts that you were talking about, and, that, and they twist them, just like they do the Old Testaments, and they allegorize them and make them purgatory, basically. Those are the things that they use. And they use that those are the, the twistings of Scripture. However, it's always funny because cultists always do this. They ignore the plain teachings for something yes. and take a parable or something spurious or something out of the ordinary that doesn't match up. Look, if you took any of those verses, right, that they use to try to defend purgatory, if you took those verses and you matched them up with the plain teachings on the afterlife, they don't fit. Why? Because they're false. Because scripture flows and it fits. It fits. And the doctrine of justification by faith fits. And if your doctrine doesn't fit that doctrine, then your doctrine is wrong. It's not Bible then. If it contradicts that, it's not the word of God. Because God's word is very simple. Jesus paid it all. He paid all. Amen. 
All right. Well, listen, you, uh, you children, we won't get to it next week probably, but um, finish up the chapter of Genesis. We want to try to finish that up. If we don't get to it next week, we'll get to it in a few weeks here when we get back to a normal schedule there, whatever that means. And uh, when we do, and, and maybe we'll have time. So memorize some. Maybe we'll have time next week a little bit. We'll see. But uh, just get them memorized and keep them up, and we'll see what we can do next week. All right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for the truths of Scripture. And help us, Lord, as we teach and preach the Word of God. May it go forth much boldness. Thank you for the scriptural understanding to see through the lies of the Antichrist beast system. And help us to defend, help us to stand up and earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.